Hi everybody, welcome. It's Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development. It is my honour and privilege to have with us Dr. Rosalind, who is a non-executive director for the oil and gas industry, NZ Oil and Gas, and also the director of the Geothermal Institute here in New Zealand. Welcome, Dr. Rosalind. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Hey, I'd love for you to share with us about your role and roles and what they encompass, because I think you carry a, a lot of responsibility. So please share with us. Sure, yeah, no, my, my life is pretty multifaceted. My uh, day job, so to speak, is as a professor at the University of Auckland. I'm currently Acting Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, and I direct a university-wide institute, the Ge Geothermal Institute, which addresses the university's capability and the way we share it with the world in research, teaching, contract education, consulting. And then externally I have um, governance roles. Uh, the most significant one um, in the oil and gas sector would be as a non-executive director of New Zealand Oil and Gas and I'm also deputy president of Engineering New Zealand. Well there's a lot going on so what takes up the majority of your time? Uh, there, is, there is obviously a lot going on but um, I have an awesome team of people I work with uh, who help me uh, juggle everything and uh, make it all happen. So um, I'm actually very, very, very conscious of, of work-life balance and uh, take a lot more time off than people might imagine. So how do you make that decision about prioritising fitness, family, work, research? What, how, do you, how, do you, how do you balance? Because in my mind, there is no balance. You're either fully into something or you're fully into something else. So how do you make those decisions since you carry so many responsibilities? Yeah, I mean, any kind of decision-making prioritisation, I mean, ultimately has to come back to a, to a sense of, of values. Um, and there is sort of a classic matrix of kind of importance versus urgence, but... Um, for instance, I really value my research team, the sort of masters, PhD, even undergraduate students who are doing research with me one on one. Um, so I give them a very clear priority in my diary that typically Thursday morning, they get their one on one meetings with me. But they also understand that there's sometimes some flexibility needed that Thursday morning might come Wednesday afternoon or Friday morning, but they, they are a priority. They, they get their time and I, I ask that you know, my, my assistants and people who help manage my diary respect the fact that the way I use my diary reflects my values. That's really interesting. Your, your diary reflects your values. And so obviously having clarity yeah. on what those values are is really important. How, how tied up with your values is, is the energy sector in New Zealand? <laughs> it, the energy sector in New Zealand and, and globally um, does definitely infuse a, a large part of my part of my week. I, I've come through a track of um, you know being, doing very very fundamental detail driven research, you know calculating things for three decimal places. But I guess as my my career has progressed, I have you know taken on a much bigger picture of you to think about the, um, the why questions, the, the really structural questions of how, how the markets work, um, the priorities around what sorts of energy sources the world should be looking for, is it still okay to be exploring for oil and gas? You know, I challenge our um, first year students, I've brought in a new first year class to an audience of 950 students where we address some of the tricky questions in energy that, you know, I drive an electric car, even though I'm a director of an oil company, I drive electric, but is that okay? Because my electric car still has a lot of um, materials that are mined uh, from a range of jurisdictions and a range of kind of um, conditions. Uh, so we actually, you know, I, I have 18 year olds thinking about the ethics of where we get co cobalt and lithium and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. Where do you think, 
because you're so deeply involved, where do you think, where is New Zealand headed to best position itself? What are the best parts of the energy sector in New Zealand? I mean, New Zealand has this enviable track record that our electricity supply is 85% renewable, plus minus, and, and on a trajectory potentially to become even more renewable, um, depending on which parts of government you listen to. I mean, these arguments about going to 90, 95, 100% renewable. Personally, I do get a bit challenged about going 100% renewable for electricity. Uh, I think the real gains in um, decarbonising our energy sector are around the non-electric side of things, around, around transport, around industrial heat. So kind of what, what gets me excited at the moment um, is trying to be part of the, the thinking around, around hydrogen. Hydrogen gets a lot of press. Uh, it's not a magic bullet, but it's quite an interesting bridge to take uh, resources like geothermal energy um, produce clean electricity with the geothermal heat, but then to use that clean electricity to make hydrogen, which then gets you to a liquid transport fuel that can um, displace fossil fuels in heavy transport. So like passenger transport, yeah, my little Nissan Leaf, $15,000 solves the problem neatly, but it doesn't necessarily deal with heavy transport yet. So using one renewable source of energy, you can create another renewable source of energy as a byproduct of that. That's really interesting. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's still, um, it's still kind of emerging in terms of a full market um, scale operation, but there is quite an interesting pilot plant going in, um, in the centre Central North Island um, at a, a Maori-owned uh, geothermal project. Uh, they will be commissioning soon, uh, give or take any COVID-related 19 delays. I mean, we obviously have issues getting international experts for, for some things over the border at the moment. Um, but hopefully by later this year, at a pilot scale, they will be doing exactly what I outlined in terms of going from geothermal to clean electricity uh, to hydrogen. Um, the challenge then is, is, first of all, building up a local market for that hydrogen to kind of sustain the operation and then to look at scaling it. Um, but New Zealand has kind of abundant resources for clean energy in terms of um, expansion in geothermal, in terms of um, things they're talking about in Taranaki with uh, offshore wind farms. So I had my first year class um, look at a discussion paper that had just been released that looked at, say, putting 20, 25 large offshore wind turbines in Taranaki and, and what could that do. Um, so if you can get significant amounts of renewable electricity in one site, you could start to do really interesting things with it. How do we manage the, the trade-off? I guess that might be the best phrase to use when we're looking at renewable energy like wind turbines and there are some environmental impacts. Obviously oil and gas, there are environmental impacts. Do you have some sort of prioritization, checklist, checks and balances in your mind when you're thinking about these things? Yeah, I mean, in, in New Zealand, that trade-off is always managed through Resource Management Act, which is kind of a, a one-stop shop for regulation of any activity, whether you're building a house, building a factory, building a big energy project. And that uh, legislation lays out a number of things that have to be balanced through our kind of environmental regulators. Um, and ultimately it enshrines um, essentially a, a quadruple bottom line in terms of balancing um, economic success of projects with um, social, cultural, environmental type values. Uh, so so the, the environment you... courts are... Mm -hmm. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, the, the environment court is very skilled at working through that and working 
through that in a very consultative way. So it, it is a process that encourages consultation with communities so they can kind of inject their values into the system. Do you think people know enough at a grassroots level to make those sorts of decisions or contributions to the process? Um, I've been involved in processes where communities have been um, empowered um, you know, by the companies uh, to hire their own experts. So, so companies have had to put up funding uh, to communities where communities have then been able to go out and hire their own independent experts and get their own advice so they can be on a much more even playing field. And in examples like um, geothermal, where there are, is a very long history of geothermal development in local areas, um, so getting up to kind of 40 years or so of development, well, more than that, 50 even, um, communities do build up quite an understanding. Uh, and in the geothermal example, our Maori communities are now economic partners in many of the projects. So they, they have a, a seat at governance level. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you face on a day-by-day -day basis across your roles as a leader? The biggest challenges? Um, I mean, aside from the, the usual just juggling, uh, juggling competing priorities, um, I, I guess I've, I've, I've always you know, learned just, just to expect the unexpected that uh, no two days are, are ever the same. Uh, you know, today I, I thought I had a relatively easy day in my diary uh, and instead 15 minutes time we're heading into lockdown officially for three or four days but in really reality who knows how long. So um, yeah, I mean that challenge of just having to be constantly adapting to, you know, what the day brings but finding that balance between dealing with the urgent, the here and now, yes, we have to respond to the fact we're about to go into lockdown, but not losing that view over the horizon. So in a leadership role, you have to be one doing the horizon scan, thinking about what is out there in the future. And it's very easy to kind of get in your own kind of bubble and only think about the, the here and now. So, I mean, we're in the rounds of a big strategy consultation at, at the university and I raised in our you know crisis meetings this morning the strategy timeline has to keep ticking we can't just park that and assume that the next decade is, is not coming <laughs> the world is still coming at us so you know it can't fall off the radar. In the last four or five years what will be one of the most exciting, interesting experiences you've had as a leader that stand out in your mind? Oh, oh that, that's a hard one. I mean, I, I, I find it excitement in, uh, in all sorts of things, but in a lot of ways, I wouldn't want to pin it down to one experience or one moment, but for me, it's, it's all about the people. Um, it's really thinking about the success that I've had a small part in enabling for a huge number of other people, whether it's people who I directly manage, whether it's people I mentor, whether it's students. Um, for me, the real joy in leadership is, is really celebrating that success and being a part of that success. It's really great. Um, if someone was wanting to have a contribution like you to lead at a level that you're leading with, could you give some career advice or some words of wisdom for some experience or learning <laughs> aspiring leaders should put into their into their plan over the next couple of years? Yeah, well, I think I mean leadership is is so much about about people and understanding people's drivers, their goals, their values. So you absolutely need. Um, technical competence, technical excellence in what it is you do uh, in the sort of community that you would be leading in. That is, for me, that's a non-negotiable. But as you kind of come through building up your own technical competence, keep your eyes open, you know, keep your eye out for role models of, you know, people who kind of look like you in terms of 
what you would want to be when you quote unquote grow up. And, you know, especially if you're coming from a, a somewhat diverse background, I mean, I'm the first woman to become a department head at the university on the, uh, in engineering. Um, I'm only the second woman to become a full professor. So, you know, to be fair, there's not a lot of people that look like me um, out there. Um, but, yeah, find those, find those models and just, just go through watching how they deal with things. So I've had people who've said, you know, I've watched how you've dealt with that situation over the last three months, six months, two years, and they can start to join the dots together in terms of, you know, how I've managed to make something work and get the outcome that a group or an organisation wanted. Okay, so technical competence, number one, and number two, look for someone that you can um, position as a role model for you to learn. So in the last, let's say, last... 12 months or 24 months, what would be the best leadership resource that you've come upon, whether it's a course or a seminar or a book? Um, I mean, the, these days, there's a great amount of stuff um, available um, online, um, you know, possibly more so under lockdown when people are consuming a bit more social media than normal. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage people to, you know, find um, folks that they want to follow that they like their style. I mean, personally, I enjoy people like Simon Sinek uh, online. He's on LinkedIn and other platforms. Um, would be would be one of my favourites. And so, what's in the future for you? It seems like you're conquering <laughs> everywhere, as you say. You know, um, you're holding a significant role, a role that women haven't held before. You have, have leadership roles across the industry, and I would imagine having an impact globally. So what's the next step for Dr. Rosalind? <laughs> Tell me and we'll both know. Um, yeah, I mean, my substantive role at the university is acting Deputy Dean um, because we are uh, having um, a search for a new dean. Um, and that search will, in many ways, define some, some direction for our faculty. And, yeah, oh, that person may appoint me to be de his deputy or her deputy on a permanent basis. Um, so I think maybe we uh, we can see till, till that search plays out. Okay, wonderful. Well, Dr. Rosalind, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your insights and giving us your valuable time at a very challenging moment in the morning going back into lockdown so thank you so much yeah no you're welcome craig happy to talk to you